everyone! Welcome to episode number 575 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by you know who. Yep, that's me, Amelia Dalton. This week, Prakash Madapathy from Cadence Design Systems and I investigate recent trends in audio digital signal processing. We also discuss how Cadence's Hi-Fi 1 and Hi-Fi 5 DSPs are simplifying ease of programming, accelerating machine learning applications, and are opening up new avenues of innovation for audio, digital signal processing, enhanced applications. So without further ado, please welcome Prakash to Fish Fry. Hi, Prakash. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Amelia. Absolutely. Okay, so first, let's talk about DSP market trends. What are you seeing in this arena right now? So it turns out that the audio market is a very dynamic market. We're seeing lots of innovations all around. For example, now the FDA in the U.S. has approved the -the over-the-counter hearing aids. And those, along with the uh, OTC, as well as the prescriptive hearing aids, all require more processing now than before, especially with the AI type of algorithms. The other trend is that the automotive space is demanding more and more performance, both of the traditional DSP variety as well as the AI variety, to the tune of not just doubling from one generation to the next, but even going up to 4X. The third thing we're seeing is that customers are viewing the DSP in a heterogeneous SOC with other compute elements as just one more compute element. So they want audio DSPs to be able to handle workloads beyond just audio. So now the audio DSPs have to become more versatile to be able to meet the demands because customers and architects want to maximize the use of all the compute elements within the SOC. And finally, what we're seeing, Amelia, is that programmability of these DSPs is getting more and more important, which is driven by a time-to-market requirement because people don't want to spend too much time in programming these DSPs. They want these DSPs to be as easy to program as, let's say, an ARM CPU or a RISC-V CPU. So those are what we're seeing, while at the same time, all the previous requirements and trends for battery life extension still remain important to customers. So let's talk specifically about your Hi-Fi 1 and Hi-Fi 5 DSPs. What do you see is driving a need for these new DSPs? And how are they simplifying ease of programming? Ah, Okay, so a loaded question, Amelia. Let me address the first part. So uh, based on the customer demands, what we found out that uh, they want the audio DSPs to also be able to handle some imaging and vision-related workloads. So we've outfitted Hi-Fi 1S and Hi-Fi 5S with 8-bit ISA instructions and multiply cumulative units or max, specifically for the purpose of these ultra-lightweight imaging use cases. With these uh, additions, what we see is that we're achieving improvements on the imaging kernels to the rate of about two times the previous generation. The imaging use cases are definitely improved. And also, similarly, for neural network use cases where they want even more AI workloads to be comprehended by these DSPs, we've added additional max to the Hi-Fi 1S, for example, to improve performance there as well. So what we're seeing is that most of these improvements that customers are looking for are either in the performance space, and they're at the high end of the DSP performance, which is where the Hi-Fi 5S plays, or in the always-on domain or the ultra-low-power domain, which is where the Hi-Fi 1S plays. So both of these improvements address the requirements that customers have put forth for us. We've also added a a new optional double-precision floating point unit because it turns out that lots of audio algorithms have sprinkled within them a double-precision code whether on purpose or by accident because of the way code originated, maybe it came from a PC world or from the MATLAB world, they have a lot of double precision code in them. 
And this code, once it's ported to an embedded platform, usually doesn't run efficiently unless the hardware platform provides some acceleration for double precision. And generally speaking, uh, DSPs don't do well in that space. So then that uh, makes it hard for them to program the DSP because now they have to recode everything in single precision and then go back and have to retest everything in their audio chambers. So what we've done is to ease the effort for uh, the software programmers to be able to run double precision code that's already in their code base, we are providing a new optional double precision floating point unit. It's a hardware block that uh, SOC uh, providers can instantiate when they choose and configure our DSPs. And what they will see when they enable that is that out of the box for, let's say, XCLib functions, or other trigonometric functions like log, tan h, sinusoid, and so on, they will see to the tune of somewhere between 30x to 35x performance improvement. With that, basically, it obviates the need for them to have to recode everything because the hardware platform takes care of it. Then the other important aspect is that we have improved the hardware of the HiFi 1S and 5S to be able to enable the compiler to perform auto vectorization. So today what happens is that once you have code that you want to optimize on a DSP, one has to hand optimize that code and that takes a lot of effort and it requires specialized knowledge of the DSP. But with auto vectorization, it's a co-design effort between the hardware teams, the DSP software teams and the compiler team. And with that, we're able to take standard C code and auto vectorize that to the level that it achieves performance parity with hand optimized code. We also auto-vectorize all of the uh, ITUT base ops and Dolby intrinsics for audio codecs as well. So not just regular C code, but also codecs also do benefit from this quite a bit. As an example, we took a very large codec that uh, without auto-vectorization consumes about 930 odd uh, million cycles per second which is not realizable in a, a DSP or the DSP cannot do anything else because it is at the limit of performance for a seven nanometer node. With auto vectorization, without having to do any other hand optimization, we were able to beat that down to 30 million cycles per second. So all of a sudden now, what was not doable becomes of possibilities uh, at 30 million cycles per second. Does that require further hand optimization to achieve the best performance? Yes, you can probably eke out more performance by you know, hand optimizing some more there. But at least the last mile is now will be easier to traverse for software engineers than having to take the original code and optimize everything from scratch. So auto vectorization really helps quite a bit in this case. And given that the, uh, the codec has a mix of different types of code that includes DSP code and control code and so on, we believe that this feature will help customers take their applications and achieve similar kind of performance improvements. Okay, so let's talk about the new Extensa LX8 platform as well. How do these new DSPs leverage this platform to deliver better performance and energy efficiency? Yeah, we did introduce the LX8 platform in September of this year. And many of those features that the LX8 platform has were driven by the need that we saw for audio DSPs. So I'm happy to state that uh, we do benefit quite a bit from the LX8. And the HiFi 1S, the HiFi 5S are based on the LX8 platform. So all the benefits of LX8 do accrue to the HiFi 1S and 5S. We have just, by the way, also introduced the HiFi 3Z and HiFi 4 to the LX8. So we're building those on the LX8 as well. So those also will benefit from the LX8 improvements. Mainly it was for the purpose of HiFi 1S and, and 5S. So let me talk about those, those features that are most beneficial. One of them is branch prediction. So what that does is normally a control code will go through uh, branches that is interspersed with DSP code, which is very dense arithmetic operations. So while the arithmetic operations are improved with the help of SIMD, the control code then sticks out as something that could benefit with some other improvements. So branch prediction helps over there. And by being able to predict which way the branch is going to go, and being able to utilize a branch table buffer that branch prediction provides. We're seeing uh, improvements in codecs and other workloads uh, to the tune of 5 to 
which is a significant improvement. That's something that uh, people struggle a lot to get uh, that range of improvement. So branch prediction is something that uh, we are very happy with the performance of that. And it's something that is configurable. So uh, customers can choose even you know, low amount of branch table buffer to keep the size of their DSP small, or they can incre you know, increase that to get the maximum performance out of that. The second one is a controller for the level two cache. It takes the system memory that typically can have you know, large latencies for access from the L1 cache to the 10 to 12 cycles, all the way up a couple of hundred cycles. The L2 cache brings that memory closer to the uh, DSP subsystem, and it reduces cache penalty significantly. And what we see is that if we take, uh, again, another large codec that doesn't fit in L1 cache and resides in the system memory, and we run it with and without the L2 cache, we're seeing an improvement to the tune of up to 50%, depending upon the system memory latency. So basically, instead of just focusing on the DSP performance by itself, we're also focusing on the system level performance, thereby in a real system with real latencies in an SOC, the hi fis on the LX8 platform will accrue excellent performance. If you have the L2 cache in there, then it is possible to achieve, even with large memory latencies, close to ideal memory performance within about you know, 5 to 10% of the ideal. So that's the L2 cache. And the third thing is integrated DMA. And they've done three things over there. One is improve its addressing range to go from 32 bits to 40 bits. And that removes awkward software, tricky footwork that customers have to do to uh, manage multiple memory windows in order to cover the large memory space that uh, their SOCs are connected to or have in, inside the chip. And therefore, with one base address, uh, they're able to cover the entire range. So there's no need to do any dynamic windowing. So it simplifies addressing uh, and software development quite a bit. The second aspect that we've, uh, we've added to the DMA is decompression for neural network workloads so that one can compress the workloads, neural network workloads offline, and then the DMA can transfer these workloads from the system memory to the local memory in compressed form and then decompress it in the local memory. So that reduces the memory footprint that these networks consume in system memory. And additionally, they also reduce the amount of energy it takes and cycles it takes to move those workloads from system memory to local memory, which is a significant percentage of the energy and, and memory consumption that neural networks impose on modern systems nowadays. The third aspect that we've added there, Emilia, is 3D transfers. So both for imaging as well as for audio workloads, most of the workloads, even in audio space, spectrographs and so on, are three-dimensional in nature. So if you just had a 2D or a 1D transfer, you would have to reprogram the IDMA to perform the full 3D transfers, and that is very inefficient and also a pain of point for software. So by enhancing the DMA to handle 3D transfers, we simplify programming and also make the transfers very efficient. So all this leads to what we call you know, ease of uh, programming. So when you have auto vectorization, as I mentioned earlier, you basically reduce or even eliminate the need for hand optimization. Well, that's a significant savings in time because most of the effort is in that optimization phase. And if the compiler can take care of it with the push button, then within a few seconds, you basically achieve the same result or close enough. And then you can ship the product much more quickly. And the other aspect of auto vectorization is that the same source code can be used across HiFi 1S and 5S because it adapts automatically. The compiler is the one that takes care of the adaptation. So the source code itself looks the same for both of the CPUs. And therefore, maintaining that source code is a lot easier for programmers. So now, even embedded programmers that are not conversant with the details of the DSP can be employed to take DSP code and port that over to the HiFi DSP. So it greatly expands availability of resources to work on the DSPs. The double precision floating point unit eliminated the need for customers to recode everything in single precision and retest in their audio chambers. So that also helps a lot in getting reduced time to market or faster time to market. 
all of these improvements are not only enhance performance, but we also help the time to market aspect of it by improving the ease of programming of these DSPs. Excellent. All right, Prakash, it is time for your off the cuff question. Now, Prakash, if you could have one meal right now, doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you have to have a passport to get there. What would you have? Great question, Amelia. I'm glad you mentioned the other side of the world almost because um, this summer I was uh, in uh, Chicago and there's uh, one meal that I had that I felt was quite remarkable. This uh, is a Kurdish place called Gundi's Kurdish Kitchen. I had a, a sumptuous uh, breakfast over there. And what did they have? They had all kinds of uh, uh, aromatic bread that they brought out and served. There was a fried cheese roll in there, uh, some Kurdish sesame butter, which was quite delicious, and um, a scramble that was made of tofu, tomato, and I think bell pepper it was it was. Uh, very delicious uh, stuff. And there was also another cheese, I think they call it uh, halloumi, sort of a hard, rigid cheese that uh, I really enjoyed. Uh, and uh, to top all that, you know, they keep bringing in their Kurdish tea, which I thought was just amazing. I enjoyed that uh, quite a bit and kept drinking tea throughout the, the bre breakfast. Uh, it was big enough for me that I had to skip lunch to uh, uh, that day. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. Yeah. So I recommend that if you ever are in uh, Chicago, Gundy's uh, Kurdish Kitchen. And I think they have uh, branches all over, the, all over the, the U.S. So probably you'll find something in your neighborhood as well. That sounds excellent. All right. Well, Prakash, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Amelia. Pleasure to talk with you. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into X, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are now on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And, of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, make sure that you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, -E at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of March 29th, 2024, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.